So the, um, the title of my talk this afternoon is Developing Temporary Works for a Modern Construction Industry. Um, we are in a dynamic time. We are moving very rapidly um, in the construction industry. Um, and as the previous speaker has mentioned, there's a lot of rules and regulations out there trying to make things um, a safer place for us to all work, which is one of the aspirations behind what I'm doing. Um, as Jess has mentioned, I come from an operational background. Um, and I was asked by our um, company technical director if I would take up the role of uh, the group temporary works director for a period of time, um, really just to improve how we deliver temporary works within Costain, um, as Jeff has mentioned off the back of some of the incidents that have taken place within um, Costain. So the idea behind this is that I'm not um, a design engineer, I'm not a temporary works designer or any sort of stuff. I do come from an operations background used to running projects, been out on site for a long time, civil engineer, um, and um, I was going to bring a sort of a fresh look and a fresh approach at it, and probably more important, make sure it was doable, make sure it was achievable, we weren't setting aspirations that weren't um, regularly achieved out there. Um, so why were we requiring this sort of a role in the position? Well, we had a lot of incidents within Costain recently. Um, the A556, we had a, a very large diameter rebar wall collapse on us, um, quite a surprise to a lot of people um, on site, some of the diameter bars in there, 25 mil bars, um, they weren't expecting it to fall over, it, it has done. Um, there was a couple of guys on the scissor lift that you can see at the back um, there, one of them was very, very seriously injured, um, touch and go whether or not he was going to make it, um, Kevin Cowley has lucky enough recovered, um, he's not back at work yet, but he's um, and he suffered life-changing injuries, but he has made a significant um, recovery. So, uh, quite a scary incident for us um, and uh, caused a big sort of shake up of what we do within Costain. Um, we've had another of, uh, incidents taking place. Um, I've removed some of the project names off here to make it a little bit um, easier for the guys that, that build this but we had a, a whaling failure um, on a shaft drive that we were doing so we we're about to put the tunnel boring machine in there. We were getting ready to construct the edit um, and they Put the first whaling beam on the site and it fell off the, uh, the gallows bracket which wasn't particularly brilliant um, lots of different reasons behind it um, but you do a root cause analysis on it um, and it would be blatantly obvious concerns that we had there was the um, the guys went back in and put the whaling beam back on without telling anybody um, and the client took this photograph so uh, quite quite shocking for us um, we had a bridge jack failure on um, a project that we're working on um, highways job very large bridge undergone three months worth of temporary works prior to um, the bridge being put in place and then it was being lowered down onto its bearings um, Friday afternoon job let's get the job done quick and they were deloading the jacks far too fast and not in the sequence it should have been done um, and ended up with one of the jacks seeing about 10 times the load it should have seen um, subsequently the jack failed hydraulic hose came off it um, and the bridge dropped down onto the bridge pier and cracked the top of the bridge pier um, and a whole lot more could have happened. Um, so we were very fortunate there. Um, it was a riddle. The guys that were in the vicinity were injured, um, but luckily enough, not seriously injured. Um, we had a power slim shutter fail on a bridge deck. Um, at the time of this failure, we had 25 different bridge decks with similar systems in place. Um, so very, very scary for us. Um, the reason behind that was we put up a mechanism, basically, so there were only two points of support, um, remove one of those points of support, you have a hinge, we're all engineers sitting in this room, that sort of stuff should never take place on a site. So we need to be building redundancy into the works that we've got to make sure that um, if you do lose one point of support, there's always a couple of other points in there. Um, and we've taken that incident back to the shutter manufacturers um, and they promised us that in future on all of the sites that they get delivered to, that won't take place. And that should be industry-wide, not just within Costain. Um, but that's Paraslim. There are other decking systems that work on metal bridges and we can't change the world. Um, so it is important that the lessons get out there and people find out about them. Um, precast failure. This wasn't um, a costing project, but they had a precast lifting failure. Um, coincidentally, we've got the slide up there and we've been talking about it. We've subsequently had about three other precast lifting incidents that have taken place within Costain. So this is a big issue. The more precast we go for, the more fabricate off-site, the more prevalent this is going to become. Um, the reason behind the precast failure was a failure of the lifting mechanism, it was just a piece of bent rebar 
basically in there. No problem with that. It had been designed correctly and been fabricated correctly and been checked correctly. Um, all three hadn't taken place, so they'd used high tensile reinforcement, bent it to a shorter radius, and again, there was no redundancy in it. So when it was lifted, it, it fell off, and they only got it about 200, 300 mil off the ground when it, it, it fell. So luckily enough, there was nobody injured in it. Um, block falls, we're seeing quite a lot of incidents to do with blocks. This was a block wall built on the outside of a um, motorway bridge. If you have people look at it and say, well, why is it temporary works? Temporary works are any works before they're in the final state that we hand them back over to our client. Um, so anywhere where there's stuff that's being left in a temporary state, it's deemed to be temporary works and needs to be looked at and checked. So lots of reasons behind why the, the, the blocks fell off. Um, were all the supports in place? Um, had they put the correct ties in there? Had the mortar um, set, etc., etc.? Um, we had a shutter lift failure. Um, they were lifting a proprietary shuttering system um, up. They were using some clamps that were designed by the manufacturer to do the job that they were supposed to do, but they weren't designed by the manufacturer to lift um, the shutter in place. They were designed to be fitted in situ. So we'd got temporary works design in place. They checked all the temporary works out so that the shutter worked. What they hadn't done is they hadn't checked the shutter to be lifted from where it's being lifted into the excavation. So the shutter manufacturer came and told us that we were allowed to lift corners, we were allowed to lift the panels, but we weren't allowed to lift this big, huge C-section that we'd got in there. Of course, the lift coordinator turns up, and there are two lifting points on it, so he thinks, jobs are good, and I can lift this shutter up. Um, so left hand not knowing what right hand was doing. We were, again, fortunate, um, although bits of formwork fell off, and it was all held uh, predominantly by the crane, and there was nobody underneath the lift at the time. Um, but we went back to the shuttering manufacturers and they said, well, it's cr pretty clear on our drawings that um, this wasn't designed to be lifted this way. It's also pretty clear on our drawings that you should be assembling all of these shutters um, down the hole as it happened um, and not trying to lift them all up in, in one piece. So a bit of corner cutting, I think, by the site. There was a few other incidents that came off the back of this. So we were using a shutter that wasn't actually designed to do the job and they had a specialist shutter um, that could have done a better job for them when they got involved in this, uh, we found that sort of stuff out as well. Um, again, um, this is with Block Falls. Um, this is on a um, civil engineering rail project. Um, we had similar instances on the London Power Tunnels, um, similar instances at um, London Bridge Station, where we're building block work walls. They're fairly skinny walls using lightweight blocks um, with construction joints, etc., etc., in there. But you can see, just looking at the wall behind you, the works aren't complete, so it's going to be subject to wind loading, which it won't have been designed by the permanent works designers for. There'll be movement joints, but the movement joints will need the lintels in place and the block work sitting above it to give its weight of gravity. So as far as the permanent works designers are concerned, they're looking at everything as a finished job. Uh, to us as engineers to make sure that we're on site, we're leaving holes out for access for scaffolding, access for plant, access for builders' works that haven't been designed and sorted out yet, the inevitable stuff that takes place. Um, expansion joints, movement joints, all that sort of stuff that we are looking and making sure that these walls are going to be stable in place. So as I say, there's probably about 10 instances last year that Costain have had with issues to do with block work. Um, so quite a lot of things to worry about, hence the reason for me doing the current role. Um, and I suppose really the missive that I've got is how do we get these lessons back out to the business? How do we make sure that everybody on site is aware of what's going on um, and we can transmit that lesson out there and start doing some Good stuff and learning and improving. So um, it's not a challenge that's just faced by Costain, it's a challenge that's faced throughout the industry. Um, so these are all some examples of reinforcement collapses. So when you find out about the incident that we had on the A556, you think, well, crikey, I've not come across rebar collapse, and I hadn't um, come across rebar collapses before. You start doing a bit of investigation, and you find out that this is prevalent throughout the industry, quite a large um, concern in America. Done a lot of research um, over there under the ASTM standards with rebar collapse, formerly to do with circular piles, large diameter piles that they have collapsing over there. Um, but there are a lot of um, incidents within the UK. So this comes from a picture from the Temporary Works Forum, another massive steel column. You can see the diameter, the reinforcement that, that's on there um, that's gone over. Um, I actually think that they bent that reinforcement back again. I have a vague feeling because um, they didn't have time to sort it all out. So they Went back and it was all tested. It took them three months to get approval from the client um, in order to do it, but um, uh, it was all put back again. That's another um, bridge pier collapse in America. Very large diameter steel, not something anyone would expect to fall over. 
Um, this is a column. Um, so they got the first lift done. Uh, they're up on the second lift. Um, and again, the reinforcement has collapsed. Um, there were some fatalities and some injuries um, in most of these pictures. Um, and the last slide there, um, close up of the scissor lift, um, that's a Costain project. That's frankly water treatment works. Um, and we were prosecuted by the HSC for that incident. Um, completely different scenario to the reinforcement that fell over on the, um, the A556 project. This is very small diameter rebar, um, thin walls inside a water treatment plant. Um, the walls are going to see equal hydro hydrostatic loading, so they're never really going to see a great deal of load. So they're just really dividing walls like internal partition walls. Um, so very small diameter rebar. We've gone for lean construction, get up quicker, faster, bigger shutters, higher diameter, um, higher pores, um, using self-compacting concrete, all that real clever stuff. Um, but what nobody thought about, of course, was the reinforcement. So the reinforcements, 12 millimeter, 16 millimeter bars or whatever, not self-supporting, not freestanding. And um, we had a similar incident on another project um, earlier on, so it had been recognized and they put some temporary works in place. And you can see there's a temporary works system in there, um, superbly well designed, um, but just not fit for purpose. It would never have done the job it was supposed to do. How do you anchor 12 millimeter rebar to this huge, great big steel support that they put in place. Plus, of course, the guys are fixing the rebar with scissor lifts. They don't want anything in their way. They want to drive up and down human nature. So nobody thought about the behavioral side of it. Nobody thought about the consequences of what was going to happen. Um, again, your usual scenario. Um, the people that put the temporary works in there, the people that put the shutters in there, the old-fashioned way that we used to do it when I was a lad working on the construction site, they'd all gone home early. Um, and the steel fixers decided if they could get the end of their run, they could do job and knock and they'd be on the road by three o'clock in the afternoon and they'd have earned their bonus. Um, a couple of guys didn't make it. There weren't any serious injuries that happened um, there, but there well and truly could have been. Um, if anyone wants to get really, really scared, um, I suggest you go on the internet and you type in reinforcement collapses. Um, it will give you a link to a couple of pictures and then you can start looking at some of the horror stories. Um, Jeff was at a presentation that the guy from Never Let Go shows us with a piece of reinforcement that goes through a guy's head from one side and out through the other. And there's half a dozen photographs on this website. So the scary thing about these guys falling in their scissor lifts is gravity. What's even more scary is if they do land on reinforcement on the other side, because then it's just a spear and it's going to go through various parts of their body. Okay, sorry to be bitter. Um, right, so some of the changes that we made within Costain in the sort of the year that, that, that I've been involved. Um, we've established what we call the Costain Temporary Works Community Forum, and we have what we call development days. Um, so I run the frontline managers forum within Costain. So we have twice annual meetings with those guys. Um, so I decided to do exactly the same thing with the Temporary Works Coordinators. So for the first time in their lives, all of the Temporary Works Coordinators within Costain were all gathered into a room. Um, and we gave them a bit of a chat and a bit of an encouragement about where they want to go. We now run those every six months. Um, so we run three events each six months. So there are three different regions, one in London, one in the Midlands, and one um, up north in Manchester. Um, and it gives them an opportunity for people all over the country to attend. Um, it is mandatory. So all temporary works coordinators are expected to attend. If they don't attend, they won't get their temporary works appointments renewed. Tough, but... Um, so what's important there is they're getting the recent lessons, so they are getting the messages out about what's happening. It's a great networking event, so we have a sort of bit of open dialogue around the tables and stuff like that. People have got stories they want to tell. We talk about membership of the Institute of Civil Engineers, for example, some other sort of training and stuff like that, and it's deemed to be a CPD day. We get the um, subcontractors um, to come along. We also get our um, supply chain with innovations and stuff to come in and also provides useful feedback to us. Uh, the suited that sit at the top and, and, and send out all the rules and regulations to everybody um, and say that shall do. Um, so they have the ability then to feed back to us and say, well, some of the stuff that you're telling us to do is absolute rubbish and we can't do it. Um, and as, as I say, I come from an operations background. I'm quite happy with that sort of feedback. Um, temporary works appointments. So we've changed the way that we manage the temporary works appointments. Um, it's now mandatory that you have a CITB accredited course um, and, and and that's you know, cast in stone. Um, we've added an additional four days worth of CB, CPD 
training a year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that part of which is attending the two days worth of forum. Um, and the appointment is now limited to one year. So whereas before we'd have the appointments completely unlimited, uncontrolled, we now limit the appointments to a year, uh, which is good. So it keeps the sort of momentum continuity going with the appointments, I hope. Because we're all like going through getting the appointments renewed, but there you go. Um, we've also put out a requirement for all of our um, temporary works coordinators to be members of a professional body. Um, and there's a footnote there, the HSC guidance on temporary works. Um, has a written requirement in there, and I will talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, I've also asked that there is only one designated lead temporary works coordinator for each site in accordance with BS 5975. So there is some confusion. Some of our projects have more than one temporary works coordinator. Uh, BS 5975 requires that there is one lead temporary works coordinator who will then manage, we talked about the CDM regulations, collaboration between everybody. So there isn't crossover and people aren't doing doubling up of the roles, or there aren't even worse gaps between them. Carried on with the changes, um, the temporary works coordinator role, we've now stipulated within their remit that they visit site twice a week, and they all sign up to say that they will visit site twice a week, so perhaps off the back of the A556, had the temporary works coordinator gone out there and had a look at the reinforcement, he might have been aware that it wasn't looking particularly sensible, done something about it. Um, Elevate the roles on site. So it was felt a little bit that um, the temporary works coordinator, I've been a temporary works coordinator, um, was one of those jobs where the, uh, the contract leader comes in and says, right, okay, well, I've got 16 jobs to give out. You can be the temporary works coordinator. I did that when I was a young lad. Off you go without thinking about whether or not it's the right role, right responsibility. So it's important that the temporary works coordinators have been appointed, elevate that role, start attending the weekly meetings, start talking about temporary works on site. And that's been fed top down as well. So I attend the senior leadership team meetings and I make sure that the MDs are talking about temporary works to their contract leaders. Complete and submit what we call the TRMP. And again, I will talk a little bit more about that. Um, that has now become named famously after some American geezer that's just got himself into power. So everyone now calls it the Trump. But there you go. If it's got a good name and it's being banded around, that's fine by me. Um, Temporary works procedures, again, I'll talk a little bit more about those later on. Um, and we've developed a couple of guys that we call verifying engineers. So they visit the sites. Now all the sites will get a visit once a quarter. Um, and they'll talk about the technical risk management plan. Uh, they'll talk about any lessons, anything that we need to know about in the business. They'll have a look at quality, safety, stuff like that as well. Um, but you should get a visit on a cost name project once a quarter from one of the two verifying engineers. And hopefully they're bringing a lot of benefit to the business. Um, we've built Temporary Works database now, which there wasn't before, which is um, quite interesting. Um, so we now have knowledge of all the sites. We now take a, um, we, we use a system called Capture within Costain to get all of our health and safety data. We have access to that system. We can now record all of the sites that are live. Um, and from that, manage the projects to make sure we've got a Temporary Works coordinator on all the projects. Um, and also build data and information on our temporary works coordinators. Are they qualified, degree qualified, etc., etc.? So um, that's quite a powerful tool that we've now got, and it gets updated once a month um, and helps with the board report, which is really good. Um, oops, sorry. And we've established some key temporary works behaviors. So um, that was done at the temporary works development days. It was done using the temporary works coordinators. It wasn't something we dreamt up. We got them to tell us what they thought were important behaviors, what they should be doing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on as well. So the way Costain manages the temporary works procedures, we have a document management system that we call the Costain way, um, and basically everything that we do has got a set of procedures written behind it. Um, so how do you drive your car? How do you claim your expenses? How do you go on holiday? How do you quality control a project? How do you manage risk, commercial, planning? They're all under the Costain way and they all exist there as how-to documents. So um, the temporary works procedures are called how to manage temporary works procedures. You'll have a little title at the front. So TWS stands for temporary works procedures um, and I'm the process owner. So what's good now is that all of these processes are badged up with the process owner. We own the documents. We have the rights to chop and change it if we want to, which is good. So it gives us autonomy within our business, but also means that there is ownership um, of that document, it's up to me to make sure that people are aware of it and it gets used. Um, the 
procedures have undergone um, a fairly major change. Um, quite interesting, talking about the CDM regulations earlier on. We had a company called Cognito do a language check for us, um, making sure that it was in common English, understandable English. Um, so we made quite a few changes um, on that. Um, I'd like to say our procedures got shorter, but unfortunately they didn't. They got longer, but uh, there you go. Um, we had Tony G and Partners do a review for British Standard BS5975 compliance. Um, this is some of the stuff they came up with, not all of it, um, but off the back of that, we've added duties um, to the temporary works coordinator's role. Um, it's now a numbered list, and it's listed very much in line with the British standard to make it a little bit easier. Um, but the, the, the point behind that is that you know, if the temporary works coordinator wants to know what is it I should be doing, you phone somebody up and say, well, you know, activity number 17 on that list, is that something I'm supposed to be doing, or can you add a bit more detail to it? Um, the Crucial bit about temporary works design brief. Um, the most important role of a temporary works coordinator is to produce a design brief, um, rock and roll. That's exactly what it said within our procedures, um, and then didn't say anything else. Nice big full stop and nothing after it. So we've changed the procedures, put a lot more information there about how temporary works briefs should be managed. And part of the last development day, a couple of guys come in and talk about what makes a good design brief. Um, and that's probably the most important thing that gets written. You get a decent design brief written, you'll get a good temporary works design and we'll be able to go out there and build it. A lot of effort needs to be put into that. Um, and a lot more detail on supervision, including particularly how to manage change and alteration. So the stuff that goes wrong on construction sites is predominantly to do with change and alteration. So if you ever ask any questions, do any deep dives, do any forensic analysis of stuff that's gone wrong, it will be because of change. So we go back to the A556, changes that took place there. They narrowed the walls, a bit more lean construction, decreased the diameter of the rebar, a bit more lean construction, uh, and they decided then to construct it um, without using scaffolding uh, and, and using mupes or scissor lifts, which may or may not have added um, to the problem, but had we had the old-fashioned scaffolding system in place, the rebar perhaps should have been tied to scaffolding as long as it had been designed to take the load. Um, we have a peer review, so um, all the temporary works coordinators got an opportunity to provide a bit of feedback on the procedures, they use them, come back and tell us what you think is good. So there was some feeling that the introduction needed to be um, revised, a bit more explanation as to why. Can we add some notes on the side so it highlights what must be done, uh, which was good. Um, and reference to British Standard 5975 and some part, um, third parties were added, so Network Rail, Highways, England, those sorts of people. Um, one of the good things is the classifications are now a template um, within the procedures. So they're a tool, so we can alter them and change them. Um, I'm quite happy to share that. So if anybody comes back to me and says, can we have a copy of the Costain Temporary Works Risk um, Classification, then yes, no problem at all. If you want to speak to Jeff and he wants to email it to you, just pull it straight out of our procedures and bang that on. So that's a really good um, bit of feedback from us, and we've had um, some good feedback from other companies, Skanskas, um, Balfabetes, for example, um, that, that, that like that tool now. The great thing about it, as I say, we can chop and change it. So if somebody comes back with some observations, we want to add some more lines in there, we can do. Um, and hopefully we can delete some stuff as well. We've added the Deputy Temporary Works Coordinator role. Um, the Deputy being, um, if the Temporary Works Coordinator isn't on site, um, that's not a subsistent role. Um, uh, it's a, it definitely a, if the Temporary Works Coordinator is away on holiday, um, sick or absent or whatever else it is, then you've got a Deputy, deputy Temporary Works Coordinator who can step in. Um, and that's quite important. We've got one of those people in place. Uh, stops people signing off, permit to load. They're not supposed to be signing them off. The competency of the temporary works coordinator has been revised, and there is a checklist which gets signed off by the project manager, contract leader. Um, so there is due diligence um, gone through by them before those appointments come through to me um, for me to sign them off as the DI. Um, and I think that works very, very well indeed. Um, and again, if people want sight of that, I'm quite happy to provide them the list that we've got there, the checklist. Um, we've added quite a few tools, so a few quick stuff. I've mentioned the temporary works classifications. Uh, there's a very good section on design briefs checklist, which is basically robbed out of 5975. Um, and there's some VE guidance notes in there, the deputy temporary works appointment. A um, bit of glory praise. This is an analysis that gets done um, every rolling quarter um, by the people who manage it, our um, um, IT department. And they come back and provide us with analysis of those um, 
how to's that have had the greatest number of hits and it's really nice to see that Temporary Works is right up there, um, second on the league table, which is good for me. Um, so I talked about key behaviours. Um, so again, this was stuff that came back from the Temporary Works coordinators. What would be the top? We actually ended up with 19, bizarrely we asked for 20. Um, and, and, and one of them was repeated, so we ended up with 19 top uh, behaviours. We then did an analysis, so stroll, poll of uh, stroll, straw poll, get my teeth back in, um, of, of what was required. Um, and this was what the guys, um, temporary works coordinators, came up and put as their top um, five. So make time to carry out your role as a temporary works coordinator. So time was seen as being um, a lot of pressure on, on the temporary works coordinators on their job. Um, and it's kind of up to them really to make sure that they are providing the the time that's required to do the job properly. Stop the works when you are know or are concerned that temporary works aren't right. Um, so the right to stop works is written into the Costain mantra. Everyone gets issued a card um, that, that, that allows them to stop any of the works on site. And, and that's everybody, commercial managers, planners, laborers, uh, the office boy, everyone's allowed to stop the works on site, issued by both of the MDs. Ask the question, what might go wrong? This is a clear remit from last year for the, the safety side of things. Um, if you're going to ask that question, you'll find out, like the Franklin Shutter incident, um, what might go wrong if you ask the carpenters or you ask the, the guys that are going to be lifting the shutter in place, what might go wrong, they will give you that bit of feedback. Um, little or no point in asking designers or design engineers or whatever else it was you need to ask the guys, the boots on the ground, people are actually going to be doing the job, um, what in their experience um, would go wrong because they will give you the answers. As I always say to my frontline managers, go and ask the question of the guy who's only got three fingers on his right hand because um, he's the guy who's had the experience and he'll tell you what's going to go wrong and he'll make sure it won't happen. Um, challenge compliance of temporary works with RAMs, drawings and procedures. So very, very important. Um, this was something we had a lot of non-conformances with. So um, were the RAMs in place? Yes. Were we going outside on site and making sure that they were in compliance with the RAMs? Well, no, not necessarily. Um, and again, with the drawings, simple drawing checks, while well, the guy on site says that's how they always do it. No, it's not in accordance with the drawings. Please stop, go back, find out why it hasn't been built um, and get it corrected. So either the drawing's got to be corrected or the work's got to be corrected. Um, identify and manage any change from planned temporary works. So I mentioned to you one of the pitfalls for the construction industry is we're very good as engineers on fixing stuff and then perhaps not recognizing that that's a significant change and it needs to go back and get checked out on the site. And I mentioned to the shield hall um, whaling that, that fell off so you now know the site um, and um, the guys cracked on with that and they thought they could come up with a viable solution and they completely missed what was actually wrong with the system. So all of the stuff that they hadn't followed on the drawings. Um, Interestingly enough, we did an analysis of those were the top, um, those are all of the 19 behaviours. Um, what are the ones that you actually do? Um, so this was done as a separate analysis. Um, so make the time to carry out your works. People have said, well, 46% of the temporary works coordinators make the time to carry out, even though it's the number one aspiration for doing it. Um, so obviously they need to make sure that they increase the amount of time that they're spending looking at their temporary works. And ask the question, what might go wrong? We're at a 60%, which is pretty good, but it really should be 100%, shouldn't it? That we're going to make sure um, that we do it. So quite enlightening, really. Um, and again, I've got no objections. If people want a copy of those behaviors, I'm quite happy to pass them out. They're on our, our system. Um, nothing secret about them, but you could do a lot worse than go and ask the teams that you work with um, what would they see as their key behaviors and then find out whether or not they actually do them and then point out um, what they regard as the top behaviours and, and how often they actually carry them out. So a bit of sort of behavioural science there for you. Um, and now the, the challenge to us is what can we do to drive the percentages up? Um, so if there's stuff down there that's a, a zero percent, um, is it actually properly zero percent because it doesn't need to be done there for it's a behaviour we can ditch or do we need to do stuff to move it up the league table? Um, okay, um, professional development, very, very important. So the aspiration now is that all temporary works coordinators will do at least four days worth of temporary works related CPD in a year. 
So two of those days will either be doing the CITB training course, attending the Costain development days, um, or other options. Um, so membership of the ICE counts, and we're now driving to get um, everyone to be a member of the Institute of Civil Engineers or any other professional body. So I will add that. Uh, so if you're a mechanical engineer, join the mechanical engineers. We've even got somebody who's a navigator and he's a member of the Institute of Navigators, but, but that's fine. Um, it's an engineering body and we're happy with that. Um, we run a crane engine piling course run by Ray Phillip in Dawson's Plant Yard. Very, very good training course. Um, so if anybody wants to contact, not Ray Phillip, but certainly contact Dawson's and get involved in that, that that's, that's fine. Um, scaffold design, company called 48.3. Do a very good scaffold design course. Um, young guy that runs that company, he's part of the Temporary Works Forum. Um, he'd be happy to get people to go along and attend that. That's not a cost aim course. Um, and we run process safety, uh, which is about understanding um, catastrophic risk um, and the potential of catastrophic risk and the old Swiss cheese, do the Swiss cheese analysis. So put in place protection measures that will stop the airplane falling out of the sky, the bus running off the road, the tunnel boring machine going wrong, or whatever it's going to be. Um, and there are a load of others, and they are all obviously mutually beneficial. So we're upskilling um, our temporary works coordinators, and in doing that upskilling, getting more professional people um, on, on board. So good for everybody. So I talked about professional membership. Um, the HSE guidance note on temporary works appointments is pretty clear. Um, I've highlighted the bit there about including stopping work. So it is an absolute mantra from Costain that um, temporary works coordinators must have the ability and also the character to be able to go and stop the works and understand um, that it's not something that's going to cause problems. It's something that's to ad ad everyone's advantage. It'll be a lot harder to go and mess, um, mop the problem up afterwards. Um, so the, the guidance note goes on then to say um, the temporary works coordinator would ideally have obviously experience of temporary works, completed formal training, bit of a no-brainer, have a degree or an HND in civil structural engineering, which is quite a high aspiration, and be a chartered civil engineer or structural engineer. Um, so that's in the HSE guidance. So if we're not being compliant with that um, bit of head scratch, particularly as Costainer is a major civil engineering company. Um, the challenge that we've got of my temporary works coordinators, 116 presently appointed, of which only, sorry, 69 are not members of a professional body. Um, so it's quite a big challenge for us now to try and raise that bar. Um, and something we're working hard on it. And lots of different reasons um, why people don't get chartered. Um, there isn't the focus and drive that there used to be. When I was a, a lad um, coming up in the, in the civil engineering industry, it's kind of de facto, that's what you do. Um, Costin has a very good system in place um, for all of our graduate engineers that join um, Costain. And that's probably about 30, um, 30 40 um, engineers that join um, each year. But that doesn't take on board the rest of the people that we employ. So Costain employs anywhere in the region of 600 people in a year. Um, we're not necessarily picking up all of the other people that are out there to make sure that they become chartered engineers. So that's a drive through the sort of temporary works forum to try and get as many people to become members of a professional body, um, not necessarily members of the Chartered Institute of Civil Engineers, any other professional body that's recognized. So Association of Project Managers, CIOB, any sort of professional body that's out there. Um, I talked about the technical risk management plan. I'm not going to dwell on this too long. Um, this is something that all sites um, now fill out once a quarter. It's really just a bit of a data collection. It comes off process safety. Um, and the idea is making sure that you are looking at what could potentially be a catastrophic risk. Um, and these forms get filled out once a quarter by the temporary works coordinator and hopefully get bought in by quality control people, um, planners, uh, safety people on site, etc., etc. So there's a lot more stuff that gets filled out in these forms um, and we analyze that data. So they're updated and verified. Um, the verifying engineers will visit site once a quarter, sit down with the temporary works coordinator, contract leader, run through all the stuff that's there um, and ask some pertinent questions on it, make sure it's coordinated with the site, temporary works register has got the same sort of information on it. Um, the TRMPs are reported at board level, so it goes on the Costain main dashboard, one of the items that gets reported there, so we get held to account. Um, statistics, I'm not going to run through the statistics on it, um, but it is important for me that um, 
the, the main board are aware of it. We do get held to account. The MDs do come down and, and sit with me and ask um, if we start dipping off the radar. Um, quite a challenge. Um, and we do other statistical analysis and feed that back to the guys as well so that they're aware um, of, of the value of it. We carry out regular temporary works audits. So we've done 36 audits last year. Um, so we use the chief engineers within Costain to do those. Um, and this is just one of the analysis, but that feed get back gets fed back to the temporary works coordinators um, and the sites that score well. So last year, the um, M6 at Haysham and um, the Edinburgh to Glasgow Improvement Program both scored a five. Um, in fact, I was up in Edinburgh um, to rescore them and they got another five. So they've done very, very well indeed um, this, this year. Sorry, then. You scored five the, the statistics aren't on. This is for last year. Blown his own trumpet. Well done. If anyone's got any questions or interruptions or whatever, please feel free. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, it does say up there, um, with apologies, this is not a costing site. Um, it's another site. This was in construction news um, about three months ago. Um, it was a platform collapse that killed a carpenter, horrifically, a 16 meter fall. Um, amazingly, there was a, another guy on the platform and he survived the fall. And there was a bloke at the bottom got struck by a shutter um, as they went down. He also uh, survived. So there were three people injured in the incident. Um, and um, there were, I can't remember, I think 20 odd similar platforms around the site um, where this has taken place. Um, and what was really prevalent about this was it wasn't actually looked at as being temporary works. Um, so the construction companies were involved all fined um, more than a million pounds. It was a big fine by the HSE. Um, and as I say, there was 20 odd platforms throughout the site of very, very similar construction. Um, so you can see there's the gap between the joists there. They were basically using joist hangers that weren't fixed properly um, just to cover up a temporary opening through which stuff was being um, lifted. So it was stuff, platform that could be removed and put, put back again, um, but wasn't temporary works, um, wasn't on the temporary works register, um, wasn't built to a safe design, wasn't being quality checked, wasn't being controlled. Um, so quite scary, really. Okay. Um, that's it. So, any thoughts, questions, opinions? Sorry, just... Yeah. Yeah. So um, the stop the work missive within Costain would take precedence over anything, programming right. constraints, cost constraints, or whatever else it is. Um, you know, if we have safety instances, the uh, ramifications of that are far greater than the consequences of missing a concrete pool or whatever. So yes, it is um, very important to us. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm going to go in my pocket here and hope I've got the card. Costain do issue the cards, but I've probably got it in my uh, rucksack. But they do issue the card out to every worker on site, um, hopefully. And um, you can see I've got it in my rucksack. Um, that allows everyone, and everyone gets a copy of the card. And it's signed by the MD. Um, but you're allowed to stop the works. And Jeff's nodding there, so hopefully he's got a copy of it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you, when you're uh, by the MS Cap, and lessons learned out the wider industry. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, are there any plans to have any industry-wide kind of platforms or forums with maybe developed code practice for temporary works? Well, yeah, there is the temporary works forum, um, which it's not just cost savings. No, 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 no. It's a, a industry-wide forum, um, which, uh, interesting enough, our technical director Bill Hewlett is the the chair of, um, and um, they meet well, twice, three times a year. Uh, and there is a website, you can type in TWF and you can get the information um, from there. And a lot of the information that's on their website is available for free without being a member, um, available to the wider audience. Um, and they, um, the events that they hold, um, we present at those events um, and people will go along and present stuff like the A556 rebar incident. Um, we were pretty prompt at getting there and making sure that we told everybody um, about the accident. So, um, it was, to me, a mature 
way of Costain looking at it. Um, you know, certainly going back a few years, then the first thing that would happen is we close the doors, and pull everybody away, and say nothing to anybody quickly uh, as fast as we could. But it, it's been felt now that um, it's much better if we're being mature about it. We do tell as many people as possible, get the industry um, up there and upskilled and learning. Um, so that, that's important. Okay. The so, uh, temporary works for are more fundamental in creating the, the masters for uh, temporary works design. Well, Correct. Which, which was uh, started last year. Started last year. Yes, started last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 An MSc in uh, temporary works. Um, and they, as I say, they've got lots of great publications. So site safety um, fencing. Uh, there's a, a design guide on that. Reinforcement rebar collapse. There's a, a, a design guide on that. A whole pile of stuff. They've also just recently produced a leaflet, a site reduction leaflet on temporary works. So yeah, TWF, go on the website, find out about it. David Thomas is the secretary there, um, or indeed join it. Any other questions? Well, I, 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 hence the reason for the new CDM regulations. It's all about early contractor involvement. There's no question at all about that. Um, and um, yes, we do. You know, there is computer capability within um, costing for doing 3D, 4D modeling uh, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we don't know enough of it. Um, I think we are a, uh, a bit of a grunt industry. Um, and we need to get a whole lot better and, uh, and improve upon that um, and you know, sort of take away the, the dirty, mucky um, stuff that we do and, and move uh, you know, forward with, with technology um, you know, build models and, and, and recreate stuff. Um, I was at a water treatment works about uh, six months ago and they have a 3D model that they've constructed using a 3D printer. Um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating to see. Um, and they've done the substructure foundations as well, so the services that they know about um, within the water treatment works um, shown on this model below it, um, and you can lift pieces off and move it around, um, and it's hands-on, um, and it's there. Um, and we did a similar thing for the Bakerloo line. Link constructed this um, model, which sat on the table. Um, powerful for getting safety talks and stuff like that. Um, also powerful for selling to your client if you've got you know things that you want to change and move around and stuff. Um, but we need to get a whole lot better at using that technology. And I think it will come, uh, no doubt at all. So, um, and faster than we currently think. Okay. We done? More questions? Sorry, got rid of complaints, got complaints there, I guess. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>